chapter 13, Marriage and United Labors. August 30, 1846, I was united in marriage to Elder James White. Elder White had enjoyed a deep experience in the Advent movement, and his labors in proclaiming the truth had been blessed of God. Our hearts were united in the great work, and together we traveled and labored for the salvation of souls. In Confirmation of Faith In November 1846, I attended with my husband a meeting at Topsham, Maine, at which Elder Joseph Bates was present. He did not then fully believe that the visions were of God. That meeting was a season of much interest. The Spirit of God rested upon me. I was wrapped in a vision of God's glory and for the first time had a view of other planets. After I came out of vision, I related what I had seen. Elder Bates then asked if I had studied astronomy. I told him I had no recollection of ever looking into an astronomy. Then he said, This is of the Lord. His countenance shone with the light of heaven, and he exhorted the church with power. Regarding his attitude toward the visions, Elder Bates made the following statement. Although I could see nothing in them that militated against the word, yet I felt alarmed and tried exceedingly, and for a long time unwillingly, to believe that it was anything more than what was produced by a protracted, debilitated state of her body. I therefore sought opportunities in the presence of others when her mind seemed freed from excitement out of meeting to question and cross-question her and her friends which accompanied her, especially her elder sister, to get, if possible, at the truth. During the number of visits she made to New Bedford and Fairhaven since, while at our meetings I have seen her in vision a number of times and also in Topsham, Maine, and those who were present during some of these exciting scenes Know well with what interest and intensity I listened to every word and watched every move to detect deception or mesmeric influence. And I thank God for the opportunity I have had with others to witness these things. I can now confidently speak for myself. I believe the work is of God and is given to comfort and strengthen His scattered, torn, and peeled people since the closing up of our work for the world in October 1844. Fervent, effectual prayer. During the meeting at Topsham, I was shown that I would be much afflicted and that we would have a trial of our faith after our return to Gorham, where my parents were then living. On our return, I was taken very sick and suffered extremely. My parents, husband, and sisters united in prayer for me, but I suffered on for three weeks. I often fainted like one dead, but in answer to prayer, revived again. My agony was so great that I pleaded with those around me not to pray for me, for I thought their prayers were protracting my sufferings. Our neighbors gave me up to die. For a time it pleased the Lord to try our faith. Brother and Sister Nichols of Dorchester, Massachusetts, had heard of my affliction, and their son Henry came to Gorham bringing things for my comfort. During his visit, my friends again united in prayer for my recovery. After others had prayed, Brother Henry Nichols began to pray most fervently, and with the power of God resting upon him, he rose from his knees, came across the room, and laid his hands upon my head, saying, Sister Ellen, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, and fell back prostrated by the power of God. I believed that the work was of God, and the pain left me. My soul was filled with gratitude and peace. The language of my heart was... There is no help for us but in God. We can be in peace only as we rest in Him and wait for His salvation. Labors in Massachusetts A few weeks after this, on our way to Boston, we took the steamer at Portland. A violent storm came up, and we were in great peril. But through the mercy of God, we were all landed safe. Of our labors in Massachusetts during February and the first week of March, my husband wrote, from Gorham, Maine, March 14, 1847, shortly after our return home. While we have been from our friends here near seven weeks, God has been merciful to us. He has been our strength on the sea and land. Ellen has enjoyed the best state of health for six weeks past that she has had for so long a time, for six years. We are both enjoying good health. Since we left Topsham, we have had some trying times. We have also had many glorious, heavenly, refreshing seasons. On the whole, it has been one of the best visits we ever had to Massachusetts. 
our brethren at New Bedford and Fairhaven were mightily strengthened and confirmed in the truth and power of God. Brethren in other places were also much blessed. A view of the heavenly sanctuary. At a meeting held on Sabbath day, April 3, 1847, at the home of Brother Stockbridge Howland, we felt an unusual spirit of prayer. As we prayed, the Holy Ghost fell upon us. We were very happy. Soon I was lost to earthly things and was wrapped in a vision of God's glory. I saw an angel flying swiftly to me. He quickly carried me from the earth to the holy city. In the city I saw a temple which I entered. I passed through a door before I came to the first veil. This veil was raised, and I passed into the holy place. Here I saw the altar of incense, the candlestick with seven lamps, and the table on which was the showbread. After viewing the glory of the holy, Jesus raised the second veil, and I passed into the holy of holies. In the holiest I saw an ark. On the top and sides of it was purest gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub, and its wings spread out over it. Their faces were turned toward each other, and they looked downward. Between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark where the angels stood was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where God dwelt. Jesus stood by the ark, and as the saints' prayers came up to him, the incense in the censer would smoke, and he would offer up their prayers with the smoke of the incense to his Father. In the ark was a golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. Jesus opened them, and I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four, and on the other six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six. But the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all, for the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious. A halo of glory was all around it. I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. If it was, the other nine commandments were, and we were at liberty to break them all as well as to break the fourth. I saw that God had not changed the Sabbath, for he never changes. But the Pope had changed it from the seventh to the first day of the week, for he was to change times and laws. And I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the first to the... Seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone which are now in the ark in the most holy place of the temple in heaven. And it would read thus, The first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses on Sinai. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is a great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth, and they came out and endured the persecution with us. I saw sword, famine, and pestilence, and great confusion in the land. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments upon them, and they rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. In the time of trouble we all fled from the cities and villages, but were pursued by the wicked, who entered the houses of the saints with a sword. They raised the sword to kill us, but it broke and fell as powerless as a straw. Then we all cried day and night for deliverance, and the cry came up before God. The sun came up, and the moon stood still. The stream ceased to flow. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. But there was one clear place of settled glory whence came the voice of God like many waters which shook the heavens and the earth. The sky opened and shut and was in commotion. The mountains shook like a reed in the wind and cast out ragged rocks all around. The sea boiled like a pot and cast out stones upon the land. And as God spoke the day and hour of Jesus' coming and delivered the everlasting covenant to his people, He spoke one sentence and then paused while the words were rolling through the earth. The Israel of God stood with their eyes fixed upward, 
listening to the words as they came from the mouth of Jehovah and rolled through the earth like peals of loudest thunder. It was awfully solemn, and at the end of every sentence the saints shouted, Glory, Alleluia! Their countenances were lighted up with the glory of God, and they shone with the glory as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. The wicked could not look on them for the glory, and when the never-ending blessing was pronounced on those who had honored God in keeping his Sabbath holy, there was a mighty shout of victory over the beast and over his image. Then commenced the jubilee when the land should rest. I saw the pious slave rise in triumph and victory and shake off the chains that bound him, while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not what to do, for the wicked could not understand the words of the voice of God. Soon appeared the great white cloud. It looked more lovely than ever before. On it sat the Son of Man. At first we did not see Jesus on the cloud, but as it drew near the earth we could behold his lovely person. This cloud, when it first appeared, was the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The voice of the Son of God called forth the sleeping saints, clothed with glorious immortality. The living saints were changed in a moment and were caught up with them into the cloudy chariot. It looked all over glorious as it rolled upward. On either side of the chariot were wings, and beneath it wheels. And as the chariot rolled upward, the wheels cried holy, and the wings as they moved cried holy. And the retinue of holy angels around the cloud cried, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the saints in the cloud cried, Glory, hallelujah. And the chariot rolled upward to the holy city. Jesus threw open the gates of the golden city and led us in. Here we were made welcome, for we had kept the commandments of God and had a right to the tree of life. Revelation 14.12 and 22.14